Welcome to the New Flesh Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Jonathan Astro. Back in July 2022, we had the privilege of interviewing Britain's strictest headmistress, Catherine Burblesing. Catherine runs a remarkable school in London called Michaela. We spoke about the school and why it's controversial, and as the numbers now show, why it's so successful. We also talked about education more broadly in England and in the West at large. <laughs> We celebrate very much about being British here. Uh, we sing God Save the Queen. Um, and people think that's all a bit weird. But actually, you know, I find it weird that if you go into a pub when the World Cup is on, you have to ask people what team you support. If you were in Colombia and you went into a pub, you would not need to ask anyone who you support. Everybody would be supporting Colombia, right? But in England, everybody's very uncomfortable about being supportive of, of English values. Welcome to the New Flesh Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Jonathan Nashto, and with me is the incorrigible, unruly, and probably poorly behaved at school, uh, Ricky Allpike. How are you, Ricky? I'm good, thanks. Yes, I was poorly behaved at, at, at school, uh, and it's something I regret. Uh, but what I don't regret is starting this podcast and getting Catherine Burblesing on board, who is our next guest who we're going to talk to. And I'm so excited because... I've been listening to Catherine speak uh, since I first uh, became aware of the Brendan O'Neill podcast, which I'm a big fan of, and I'm just so excited she's here. Yeah, well, um, yeah, well, we'll work on your discipline uh, another time, but yeah, let's let's get into this uh, interview. Let's go. Catherine Bebel Singh, CBE, is the founder and head teacher of Michaela Community School, a free school established in 2014 in Wembley Park, London. The inner city school is renowned for its rigorous behaviour standards and now its outstanding academic achievements. She's an Oxford graduate and the author of two books, Singleholic and To Miss With Love. She also edited and contributed to the books, uh, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Teachers, The Michaela Way, and Michaela, The Power of Culture. Uh, in 2021, Catherine was appointed chair of the Social Mobility Commission. Catherine, welcome to the New Flesh. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, Catherine, you've done so many interviews now, and I want to know, how long into an interview is it before you can tell that a hit piece is coming? Because uh, <laughs> I only ask because it seems like taking you down is a full-time job for some people out there. Yeah, but they don't tend to interview me. <laughs> um, that's the point they just take some tweet out of context or some quote that some journalist has taken out of context and then they run with that the people who interview me are actually because they actually hear what i think so then we have a real conversation so yeah <laughs> well can you give us uh, a bit of an introduction into michaela community school for our listeners out there yeah, so I'm considered to be Britain's strictest headmistress, is what they say, <laughs> which is slightly ridiculous. Um, and the reason why they say I'm strict uh, is because if you come to our school, you'll find that everything's very calm. Uh, we have silent corridors, meaning that the children walk in silence and single file to their lessons. And it's not that they're being beaten into silence. It's that they are quickly rushing to their lessons. So the transition might only take a minute and a half, and it means they get more time in their lessons. Um, it's also the case that as they pass their teachers, they're saying, morning, morning, morning. So we're not actually silent. But in any case, so that's one thing that makes us strict. I would say I'm strict because strict is about immersing children in love and holding your standards really high for them. And it's about clarity and consistency. So one of the things that strikes the guests who come, and we get over 600 visitors every year from all around the world, mainly teachers, but also other people. Uh, the thing that strikes them the most is the fact that there is consistency within the classrooms. They all The teachers all use the same behavior systems. They have the same high expectations. We all use the same booklets to teach from. So it isn't, I think often when you go to secondary school, it's a bit of potluck. You may get into this good teacher's classroom over here, but you might get into this one that's not so good. And you can have a very mixed experience. In fact, all the data uh, shows that people think they get their kids into a good school that they're okay. But actually, the in-house variation in one school between the best teacher and the worst teacher is far greater than the difference between the teachers at the good school and the bad school. And people just don't realize that. And that's because there isn't any consistency. And I believe very much in being very clear with the children so that they know this is wrong, this is right, and I can make that choice. I believe children have agency. And so if they choose to do the wrong thing, I think they should have a detention. 
that apparently makes me the strictest headmistress in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got we've got loads of questions on sort of the inner workings of of your school, but perhaps take take maybe a step back. Uh, so the school was established in in twenty fourteen. And uh, it, it's it's called a free school, and so uh, maybe you can explain how how that sort of works. But but also we've heard that there, there was sort of a, a lot of initial pushback uh, from people in the community for you to try and set up this school. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that that as well. Yeah, well, they weren't people in the community. <laughs> in fact, so what happened? First of all, what's a free school? A free school is like a charter school in America, um, and it's a brand new thing. It was a brand new thing in 2010. So we were trying to set up and we were, it was new. Nowadays, it's not so controversial. And charter schools were also controversial in America in the early 1990s. And uh, it meant that people would protest outside our parents' evenings. Um, they would shout obscenities at me. They would have placards uh, denouncing me. And um, they, they got very angry. These were people who were bussed in from out of town <laughs> to protest. The actual community was desperate for another choice of school. And it was really interesting because it was often a, a divide along race lines. So what I mean by that is I would go to the local market and lots of black mums would be signing up and really interested. And they'd come along to our parents' evening. And all these white middle class people would have been bussed in from outside of London to then protest outside to stop these black mums from getting another choice of school. It was mad. Now, you might think, why were they doing that? Because they didn't believe in free schools. They felt it was a political football. It was an idea that came from the Conservative Party, and the Conservatives, as we all know, are evil. Therefore, the free schools must be evil. The unions, teaching unions, were very much against free schools because they felt it broke up their power. And so there was a lot of um, a, a lot of nonsense going on around about, like, what I mean is there were lots of myths that people believed about free schools. And the people who were protesting were real leftist extremists uh, who just don't believe in any kind of freedom in the public school system. And even though we're a public school, we get publicly funded, just like any other local school. Um, uh, we don't have any choice over the kinds of kids who come here. Our admissions process works just like any other school. Um, they still hated us and they would make things up. They would say, for instance, that being a free school, this was privatizing education. I have no idea why they say that. There is no, there's nothing private about our school. It's an inner city school that serves the local community. Um, and we get funded by the government. So, um, but that is what a free school is. And we had a real fight. It took us three and a half years to set up. Uh, three and a half years because they stopped us. We moved from district to district trying to open. And our detractors would somehow fix it so that we wouldn't get the building that we wanted. Eventually, we got to Brent Wembley, which is right next to Wembley Stadium, this building. And it was because the local council didn't actually own the local build, this building, that the central government were able to buy it for us. And, um, and then we were able to set up. But uh, it was, it was a real fight. And, um, but those three and, years, uh, Catherine, must have been very stressful, right? Very stressful. And particularly stressful when I think about those families in the different districts where I promised them a school <laughs> and they were so excited about being able to send their child there. And then it was pulled, the rug was pulled out from them in three different, in, well, two different places. This is the third place we came to where they thought they were going to get this great school and it didn't happen. And yes, for me, it was extremely stressful because right now it's all very nice to look back and tell the story, but I didn't know we were going to open at the time. I was trying to survive by doing some writing in the newspapers and doing odd jobs here and there, but I had to pay a mortgage. I had to survive. I was also running around with flyers, giving them out to people on the street and trying to encourage them to come to our parent evenings. Then I'd go to a parent evening and some crazy leftist, and when I say crazy leftist, I'm, you know, I'm not talking a normal lefty. I'm talking extreme leftist who would stand up and shout at me and say, you betrayed us when you spoke at the Conservative Party conference. And that was a I, long time ago from what I gather. <laughs> yes. Yes, but not then. So I spoke okay. there in 2010. So in these days, it was kind of 2012. Or something. Oh, so it was. this was a fresh wound. They were like, how dare me. you? Yeah, they hated me because I'd spoken at the Conservative Party conference. And they would say, you betrayed us. And I'd think, I don't even know who you are. How could I betray you? This is crazy. But because I was a teacher, I'm an ethnic minority, I, I'm a teacher in the inner city, we are not allowed to think for ourselves, essentially. I am meant to be supportive of the leftist agenda. And that's what they would mean when they'd say I'd betrayed them, because I'm not allowed to think for myself. 
we're, we're, we're in, I'm interested in the the demographics of the students as well. So what, what kind of student attends Michaela? And, and obviously they're all from the local area, yes? Yeah. So they're inner city kids. They're typical inner city kids. There's all, I mean, I have to say there's, there's a small number of white kids. Most of them are brown and black. Um, they come from a whole, you know, like second generation, third generation coming from anywhere from the Middle East to Asia to Africa to the Caribbean. I mean, all over the place. And we've also got a, a lot of Eastern, somewhat Eastern Europeans. Um, but it, that's just the area that we're in. Uh, when you walk down the street, it's just very multicultural. People are from all over the place. And um, and so we just represent the local community, really. And generally working class. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have any middle class kids here at all. No, mm. they are all mm. working class. Well, there's a new documentary out about the school, which I, th I think came out uh, only a couple of days before this recording. C can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, and also your viewers can see it because the producer has a website called strictestheadmistress.com, which is a bit ridiculous. But it's because the, 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 the documentary is called Britain's Strictest Headmistress. And it was on TV on Sunday, but that was a shorter version. The 90-minute uh, version, which is what I would recommend, is on the producer's website that your viewers can, or not viewers, your listeners can listen to or watch. And um, I have 12 rules uh, for how to raise children. So this isn't just for teachers. It's also for parents. Our electrician here at school saw it and said it made him into a better father. And I, I, I've heard that from a number of people, that they really are changing the ways in which they interact with their own children thanks to the inspiration that they found in the documentary. So it tracks a couple of our kids and how they do here because two of these kids joined the school because they've been badly behaved elsewhere. And it looks at seeing well, how, what happens in a strict school for them. And, but it also allows me to lay out my rules on what uh, works with kids. So rules like holding your standards high, uh, not giving your children unsupervised access to the internet, i.e. don't give them a smartphone. Um, rules like uh, celebrating your country. You know, we celebrate very much about being British here. Uh, we sing God Save the Queen. Um, and people think that's all a bit weird. But actually, you know, I find it weird that if you go into a pub when the World Cup is on, you have to ask people what team you support. If you were in Colombia and you went into a pub, you would not need to ask anyone who you support. Everybody would be supporting Colombia, right? But in England, everybody's very uncomfortable about being supportive of, of English values. Well, if there were people, I know some people at some very popular publications in the UK who might say that, you know, those sound like very interesting ways of, you know, perhaps bringing people together in cohesion, but wouldn't it be, we could, couldn't we just have instead the LGBTQI flag um, and add a few more colors and just get everyone to salute that? I mean, isn't that inc more inclusive by definition or? Well, I have to say at our school, you would have to have so many different colors. And that's one of the things that's so ridiculous about the flag there. They keep adding more and more colors and it just becomes ridiculous. I mean, look, the fact is one of the reasons why we need to celebrate being British is because is, is precisely because people can live their lives as they want. The police don't take gay people and push them off buildings as they do in some countries, you know? Like, the fact is you can live a free life. You can get married if you're gay. You can do any number of different things. And so that isn't what brings us together because some of us are gay, some of us are, what, any number of different things. Some of us are black, some of us are brown, some of us are, are, are Muslim, some of us are Hindu. We're all different. But the one thing that binds us together, like you said, that makes it cohesive is the fact that we are British. And if you want to have a functioning country, we all have to share something and we all have to believe in something. So I am not any kind of royalist. It's not like I have plates at home with the queen's head on it. You know, I don't care about the queen. All I care about is all of us loving our country so that we can be one together. And and you sing Jerusalem as well. And I, I studied that when I went back to, to university, uh, yeah. the William Blake poem and heard that rendition. It's possibly one of the most beautiful, beautiful things ever created by human beings. And yes. I don't understand. I'm going to come back to this again later. Why why do we have to defend this? Do you know what I mean? Like if, if you can listen to those children singing Jerusalem and criticise it, I think we, we've, the discussion is going to be hard from that point, in my view. Yeah. Well, and what you're saying is that the person who's criticizing it obviously has ulterior motives because actually it's beautiful. The children singing Jerusalem together. Why isn't that something that we would all think isn't that beautiful? And the reason why they don't think it's beautiful is because I just think there's a lot of self-hatred. And when I say self-hatred, I mean, 
hatred for their country. They feel so deeply uncomfortable about being English uh, because they've been told so many times that England is a bad country because of the bad things that England did in the past. And I'm not saying that England's always been perfect, but the fact is it's done some good things too. It's done some bad things. It's done some good things, just like any country. Um, it's just that England happened to be a lot more successful at some of the, some of their pursuits, you know, their, their, their pursuit, you know, colonialism, they ran half the world, etc. I mean, I get that, but the fact is, um, that they also tried to abolish slavery. I mean, there's a million things we could go, we could weigh it all up. You know, in the end, I don't think it's for us to say, yes, it's a good country. No, it's a bad country. You are what you are. And you can be proud of your country while still being critical of it. In fact, I would argue that that is when you are most critical of something, <laughs> is when you love it <laughs> and when you feel you are part of it. If you do not feel part of it as an ethnic minority specifically, you then think, I'm not British. I don't belong here. And I, I genuinely think that one of the reasons why uh, black boys in the inner city will end up joining gangs is because they don't feel they belong anywhere. If they don't have a father in the home and they don't feel they belong in part of their family, if they don't have a community that supports them or a school that's, that, that's holding them in tight as we do by being strict and inspiring them with teachers who love them. If they don't have any of that and they don't feel British, they feel like an outsider. And all of us have a natural human instinct to want to belong. And so what they do is when they meet the gang members, they suddenly feel like they're part of a family and they're they're sucked in easily because they were never part of a family outside of that. Well, just mm -hmm. on that, just going back to that documentary for a second, uh, were you happy with the results? I mean, did anything appear in the doco, the doco that you feel misrepresented the school? Yeah, well, there are a few things. But generally speaking, I think they were fair, the doc makers. I mean, one of the things that's difficult is you invite documentary makers into your school and you're not really quite sure what they're going to end up doing. But one of the reasons why I allowed these people in was because the woman who was doing it, she was very lefty. She calls herself a lefty liberal. She still is a lefty liberal. And, but over time she visited us and I could see her changing her mind about things. And I could see her being convinced because she'd speak to the kids and the kids were so happy and so successful. And she'd think, oh, well, maybe this is working. So because she was being, you know, I could see that. I thought, well, maybe we'll trust her. In terms of the stuff in the documentary. So at the beginning, there's this scene with one of our teachers and it looks like this is how we start all lessons. And she says, step one, and the kids kind of stand there and step two, and then they move to the side and step three. And this is all just to get them to sit down. And it seems rather laborious and exaggerated. And if you watch the documentary, you get this feeling that everybody in all our lessons sits like this. Can you imagine our, our big 16-year-old sitting down like this? I mean, it would be ridiculous. The reason she did this is because she had her little lovelies in year seven, not the brightest ones, you know, and she had that class. And they were obviously struggling with knowing how to sit down. So for a few weeks, she then supports them and scaffolds them by breaking it down for them. The doc makers come in and film that. And that, of course, looks super strict. And they put that on the documentary and it makes it look like all our lessons are like that. When in fact, it was a few weeks with a little lovely set of lovelies, you know, in year seven. So um, that, for instance, I didn't think represented us. I think, I mean, I think the film comes across as warm enough. But actually, I would say there's a lot more love and a lot more warmth here that you just don't see on the documentary. I don't think that's the fault of the documentary makers because it's actually quite hard to film love. Like, so when a teacher has that little conversation, you don't say to the doc makers, oh, come and film me now having this intimate conversation with this child. You're they would in America. <laughs> in, definitely. Def <laughs> they definitely do that. In fact, I've worked on Project Runway and a few other little things here in Australia. They definitely do that. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a producer who goes, come on, oh, could you do that thing again? Say that lovely bit again. But anyway, you were trying to be authentic and what you're yeah. saying is holds true. Yes. So those are the two big things I'd say. Oh, I mean, there's a number of things that I would, if I made it, I wouldn't have put in, you know, I mean, I, they, they want to make it look super strict, don't they? So at the yeah. beginning, you're just being bombarded. We want to make it look, system. basically, we want it to be scum. We want it to be just Ray Winston, you know, just like uh, that old movie, you know, like the Borstal yeah. sort of setup. But Yeah, but they do. The thing is, in the end, the doc makers redeem themselves because they make it look really super strict. But in the end, they sort of, their idea, I suppose, is they're trying to show how that then works and, and helps kids. Um, and of course, we are strict. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not denying that. Um, 
it just is a bit too extreme. That's all. Mm. Well, I look forward to seeing it. Actually, I'll have to. Uh, I have to check it out. Uh, it's on um, this website, as I said, strictest min- had to miss. Yes, well, we, we we will put a link to that uh, in our show notes uh, in the podcast. But uh, recently, some people uh, seem to have been outraged that you pointed out something that's fairly obvious when you look at the data, which is that when given a choice, generally speaking, girls and boys make different decisions about what they want to study based on what interests them. And on on average, boys tend to take up math and hard science and girls on average tend to gravitate more towards the humanities. So can you explain where the controversy is here? Well, that was it. (laughs) I mean, they, I, I said that our girls, I mean, what is so ridiculous? They were talking specifically about my school. And we'd actually had a whole 20 minute discussion where I was explaining about cultural issues that could go wrong in a school that might make it so that girls don't choose um, sciences because they were talking about sciences. And I said that, you know, they need role models and they need to see themselves in these sorts of subjects. The fact of the matter is I have an entire physics department staffed with female teachers. So if my girls then haven't chosen physics A level, I don't think it's because they didn't see physics teachers who weren't, I mean, they're only female. So I've already addressed the cultural issues. We've also got excellent teaching, really strict environment. So normally your kids who are more vulnerable fall off, you know, the wagon as it were, if you have uh, a more chaotic uh, situation, we don't. So my point is once you've controlled for those cultural issues, which I recognize do exist, um, if girls are still not choosing it, it's because they don't want to do it. So our girls, our physics class, there are six kids, five are boys, one's a girl. Our biology class has 26 girls, 12 boys. This is an A-level. So the reason is because a lot of the girls want to do, uh, they want to get into medicine um, and they want to do an, a, a, an empathetic career because women on average prefer empathetic careers. Men on average prefer sympath- uh, systematic careers. Uh, that's on average. There are obviously brilliant physicists and brilliant mathematicians who are female. They're in my school teaching right now. <laughs> like, I thought that I don't think that. It's just that on average, women, it's one of the, re- and you know what? I, I actually think it's really interesting. I think that this really points to a deep misogyny that a lot of these people have because they can only respect what men tend to do. So what I mean by that is my profession, for instance, is often derided. Becoming a teacher, well, anybody can do that. And I think that's because historically it was what women used to do in the main. And we we are unable to think, we, we as women think, well, the only way I can get respect is if I do what the men do. And I'm thinking, you know what? I don't like hard maths or easy maths. I don't like any kind of maths. I don't think I'm stupid, right? I actually think what I do, which doesn't involve much maths, is really, really hard. (laughs) Um, And the point is biology is just as hard as the maths or the physics. It's just that my girls have chosen to do biology. I don't think becoming a doctor is easy. They want to become a doctor. Medical school is hard, (laughs) right? So it's not that my girls are stupid. And a lot of people took that, what I said to mean was I was saying they weren't capable of doing the maths. I didn't say that. I said they didn't want to do it. And the fact is that this idea of quotas, 50% doing maths and 50%, then what what should I do? My, My French class that has more girls in it, should I force the boys to do the French and force the girls to do the physics? It's insane. I mean, people, look, they're 16 years old. They're able to make their own choices. I have given them the role models and the environment, which allows them to make choices that are real for them. And I'm going to back them on this. I find it highly disturbing that anyone would think otherwise. But unfortunately, there are people who do think like that. And they do think that they're going to keep on campaigning until they've got 50% divide for the genders amongst the subjects. Mm. Well, it's, it, it's all those crusty old physics teacher, male physics teachers that are just like telling the girls that they can't do physics. You can't do physics, you're you a girl. physics, you're a girl. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I do think that there's a point about the cultural point. You know, if you, if you only had uh, science teachers who were male, if they'd never seen a female uh, do well at physics, I could get that. I could get that that would have a negative influence on them. But that just isn't the case at my school. And I was only talking about my own girls. But it said to be one of it, that, that whole issue is such an aha moment for these people. Like they sat there and waited and then they just pulled off their clothes and there was the Guardian t shirt and they went, aha, you said it. Girls aren't as good as boys. And that's what you believe. And that's what your school's about. So, I mean, that's what got that guy, James Damore, like run off the face of the earth from Google. He wrote, he, he said the same things you said. 
and now he's gone from yeah. history. Has he gone from history? What's happened to him? I well, I don't know. He's probably doing quite well um, in the private sector. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being, I'm just saying. Probably runs like, a yeah. podcast, you know. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> well, yeah, that's exactly right. I'd forgotten about him. That's exactly right. He just said, look, like this is just obvious stuff to everybody. And yet we're all pretending that it's not true. And the thing is, if you made me do physics, I'd be very unhappy. <laughs> you know, I just, then, it's so ridiculous that I'm a woman. What you think I'm going around oppressing all my girls? Like this is just crazy. <laughs> so, so maybe what I mean, we'll move off the the haters in a second. But maybe just to put a put a a bow on it. What? Why do people want you to fail? Uh, even up now, not just those people at the beginning. There seems to be. So I wish I was being hyperbolic here, but you know, just going on Twitter after after we we booked you for this. I mean, people want you destroyed, and they want the school closed, and they want the earth salted. What? Why? Yeah. Why? Why is this? Yeah, that's right. You know, I wrote a tweet at one point when they were accusing us about something else, and I said, "How about we just?" I was being sarcastic. I said, "How about we just be, close the school and be done with it?" And tons of crazy lefties were re, were re, retweeting this, saying, "Yeah, close the school, close the school." Um, and when you think that we are transforming the lives of poor inner city kids for the better. Um, you have to wonder what their motivations are because they say they care about the downtrodden. They say that they care about helping children like ours, and yet they want our school closed. So you just have to question what they actually want, really. And um, I would argue that it has to do with, it's what I said earlier about, um, I'm not allowed to think like this. So they feel they own me. They feel that as, you know, I'm brown, um, they, they, they own me. They own my thoughts. I'm not allowed to disagree with them. And, um, they're so used to, uh, owning brown people. And when I say owning them, um, you know, here in London, for instance, if you're in an ethnic, uh, eth very ethnically diverse, uh, borough, they'll all vote labor. They'll all vote to the left. <laughs> and so people are just used to brown and black people being owned by the left. <laughs> and when they break out of the left, there is an outrage of how dare you. And that's a visceral thing, which cannot be explained. And so they'll, what you're talking about is, it's not that there are some people who are quite thoughtful and they might disagree with certain bits of the school, but they agree with other bits. I'm talking about the extremists here who just, no matter what they're presented with, no matter what the data says, they don't care. They're just looking for something to hate about it. And that's because it's a visceral response to me because they hate me so much. And I think partly it has to do with me thinking for myself and they're so not used to seeing brown people do that. Well, they sound like uh, racist to me. So uh, perhaps we should uh, move on to something more positive. In terms of content, you teach what has been pejorative, pejoratively called uh, dead white men. So we've got Dickens, presumably, a little bit of Dickens, Shakespeare, for example. I'm sure there's others. Now, the company line out of education and uh, secondary, but even tertiary uh, for some time now has been that these authors and men like them are either overt or covert racists and or misogynists who have been used in a conspiracy to keep diverse authors, women women and people of colour, out of the classroom. So why do you think it's worth teaching these white supremacists? <laughs> well, I don't think that they're white supremacists. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I think that, well, one, Shakespeare has been influencing literature for 400 years. Uh, Maya Angelou, African-American female author, uh, would used to say that she felt she, when she first read Shakespeare, she thought he had to be a black woman because he understood her plight as a black woman in America. The point is, is that Shakespeare is universal. They don't like us saying that Shakespeare is universal because what they'll say, the extremists, they'll say that you can't know our pain as, as LGBT people or as black people or as women or whatever it is. Um, he couldn't possibly know because he's a white man and therefore he's an oppressor. And I would say that Shakespeare is an extraordinary writer and has been influencing literature for 400 years. And had Maya Angelou never read Shakespeare, she wouldn't be the great writer that she is. You need to know what a Scrooge is. You're a bit of a Scrooge. If you don't know that, you can't participate in society. You need to know that a rose would smell as sweet. You need to know, if I say to you, could I please have some more? You know exactly what I mean, right? That's well, that singing, probably. <laughs> the, whole, the, whole, the whole thing. Exactly. I mean... And the thing is, there is a there is cultural knowledge that we are all we all take for granted that we have that enables us to participate in society and be successful. If you're a kid growing up in the inner city from a poor background, you 
are depending entirely on your school to give you that knowledge. And if you don't have, if if your teachers don't give you that knowledge, if your teachers read a book about knife crime in the inner city in London, for instance, well, you already know about knife crime in, in, in inner London. And that book that you're reading, it might be interesting. And we have books in the library that they can read in their own time. But studying that instead of studying Dickens, for instance, (laughs) means that you are not accessing any of that cultural knowledge that will help you get on in life. And that means that you are imprisoning these children in their class and in their race to be such that they can never break out of it. You're saying that a black child cannot read Shakespeare because he's black and that he can only understand authors that are the same color as he is. I don't believe that's true. I think we can all understand authors. I can understand male authors. I can understand white male authors. I can also understand female authors or black female authors. I mean, I am a black female author. You just said so, right? I'm not insisting that they read my books instead of Shakespeare. And you know why? Because I haven't been influencing literature for 400 years. But if the day were ever to come where I was influencing literature for 400 years, then I'll be all for them teaching me instead of Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just don't understand. It's so obvious to me. I mean, it's so obvious. But it, because there is this campaign against dead white men, or white men in general, actually, um, that they're seen as evil, and therefore we need to get, get rid of them. Now, I'm not even saying only teach dead white men. At A-level, for instance, we teach uh, Andrea Levy's uh, Small Island. We took all the kids to see the performance recently at the National Theatre. It was absolutely brilliant. I mean, I'm not saying we do some uh, black poets as well. You know, it isn't the case that we only teach dead white men, but we do teach four Shakespeare plays. We want them to know we they memorize some bits of Julius Caesar, you know, his whole speech on courage they memorize. We do Romeo and Juliet. We do Othello. Um, we do Macbeth and we do it inside out so they really know these stories. That's what school's about. <laughs> it's about accessing things that you wouldn't otherwise have accessed. What happens far too often in schools like mine is that we try and make things so-called relevant for people. So we're only giving them the stuff that they would have accessed anyway. The whole point of school is to take them beyond their horizons and show them things that they would never have learned without you. That's that's very well said. But no doubt there are some second-rate texts written by dead white men, uh, but your detractors seem to want bona fide masters cancelled along with them. Uh, and then this is one fight that, that John and I are, are passionate about. Uh, but I'd like to know, when we stopped laughing in the face of these ridiculous claims, but perhaps we can argue about 20th century literature, what should stay, what should go. But the notion that the man who wrote Ble- the Bleak House or Hamlet or Crime and Punishment are somehow arbitrary is is supremely silly. Shouldn't we just be grateful instead? Yeah, well, I agree with you. They're great books. They're great plays. Let's enjoy them. And let's not think, but he's not the same color as me, therefore I can't appreciate him. You see, the thing is, is that these extreme leftists are just extremely racist, ultimately. But that is racism, the idea that you can't access something because you're not the same color as the person. Shakespeare's really hard to read, okay? I mean, we all know this is old English. It's hard to read. Are you really telling me that my Polish uh, kid in year seven is able to access Shakespeare in a way that my kid who has a Jamaican background, he's not able to access it, but the Polish kid can because he's white? That's insane. Like, I, mean, I, just, I don't understand why this is being said, but that's how they think. Look, we agree with all that. So uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know what to say. Just keep. Just keep. Keep doing all of that. Okay. All right. So, but it seems you've been vindicated in some respects because the stats are out and your school is performing well. You know, I know you've got your hard taskmaster, or so the ITV says. But uh, you're performing very well now. Can you give us the the lowdown on on how the school is is doing? Uh, you know, uh, compared to the national average. Yeah. Uh, well. I mean, COVID happened. So the national uh, results over those couple of years have all been, you know, you you can't go by those. But in 2019, we had our first set of results. That was before COVID. And these were the national exams, which put us as as fifth in the country in terms of the progress that the kids had made. And we had the best maths department. We had the third best science department in the country. That's what's hilarious. They're all telling me how I'm oppressing our girls. Well, we have the best maths department and the third best science department in the country. Well, half those kids taking the exams were our girls. So clearly, we are not oppressing them. But in any case, and we're not stopping them from doing science and maths. Um, so that was at GCSE level before they get to A level. Uh, and I mean, we did really well. So academically, we do really well. But the thing I'm most proud about about our school 
It's just how resilient our kids are, how, how grateful they are, how kind they are to each other, the kinds of people that they're going to become later. And when guests come, it's, it, you know, they always comment about what our children are like as people. And that is so important. And I think people underestimate how the secondary school you choose for your child will in part determine the kind of person they will be as adults. It will actually change their characters. Um, and people just don't realize that. That's why our last book is called The Power of Culture. The, the culture is so powerful in forming who they will be. Well, if what we I drill down into, into some of the specifics here, uh, some of your strict policies get you a lot of criticism, which, which we've touched on a little bit. But why is discipline important for learning? Well, if kids are uh, misbehaving in the lesson, then they can't hear what the teacher's saying. Um, so in inner city schools, it's not unusual for fights to be breaking out in the middle of the lesson, for chairs to get thrown, for kids to jump out the window, for all sorts of nonsense to happen. Even if you're in a school that doesn't have such a challenging intake, you will get lots of low-level disruption. Kids talking to each other, kids doing this. So imagine if we that, were that talking now. That was and we're doing this. <laughs> you can't concentrate on what I'm saying, can you? It's really hard. And so, and imagine three or four of them doing that, right? Um, so then the teacher's saying, can you stop that, please? Can you stop that, please? Come on, Johnny. Can you stop that, please? Johnny, come on. Oh, what am I going to, I'm going to have to give you the time. Oh, come on, Johnny. Come on, Johnny. In the end, you have to throw Johnny out. Then when Johnny gets up, all the kids go, ah, can you believe it? Oh, and they start doing this, right? <laughs> you're still not teaching anything. You're not learning anything. So all this time is taken, Johnny goes outside, teacher tries, okay, let me just get back to what we were saying. Now, if I just explain to you about Macbeth, suddenly the door bangs open, bang. Johnny rocks in, miss, I can't find where you meant to tell me to go. The kids all start going, ah. Like, isn't it obvious why it is you need good discipline in a classroom? Nightmarish. Well, so what is the, the Michaela version of that scenario? Give me Johnny in Michaela. How would that go? Yeah, Johnny, it's quite interesting because – People say to me, well, what happens when they get into fights? What happens when they throw chairs? And I say that stuff doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is because if you, it's just like if you look after the pennies, the pounds take care of themselves. If you deal with the little things, the big things just don't happen. So if our kids want to rebel, they pull their ties down a bit, right? Because we're really hot on uniform. And if you don't have your uniform looking just right, you're going to get a detention because I'm the strictest headmistress in Britain. And if, if your tie is down, you're going to get a detention. So the bad boys go, look at me do this. I'm going to pull my tie down. And then they end up with the detention. That means that they then don't have to bring a knife into school to prove that they're the bad guy. They don't need to beat somebody up to prove that they're the bad guy. You know, when I say prove that they're the bad guy, what I mean by that is there's a reputation that some kids want to have. Look, I'm the cool one here and I can defy the teacher. And so to defy the teacher at Michaela, you just need to do a tiny thing to get something wrong and you get into trouble. Whereas at other schools, because they haven't drawn the tent fence in tight enough, in order to rebel, you've got to do some really awful stuff. Well, there seems to have been a shift somewhere along the line away from discipline in schools more broadly. And, the, you know, there used to be standards around uniforms, behavior in the classroom, as well as in the playground and, and standards around how you would address teachers and classmates, for example. And, and there were consequences for, for bad behavior, which... Obviously, it sounds like that there are many consequences for bad behavior at, at, at your school. But what do you think is to blame for this shift? Is it the pedagogy of student-led learning or, or or maybe it's the pendulum swinging away from sort of, you know, old policies around punishment, such as giving students the cane and and that sort of thing? What do you think's led led to that? I think it's both those things. So, I mean, it was good that we moved away from the cane. There's no need for that. You can just give merits and demerits and just be consistent with all your teachers and it works. Um, so it, it was that movement and some of it was good. It's, it's good that we no longer hit children, <laughs> but we've just gone too far. Um, and we've got to the point where I'm actually finding I have to defend detentions. I mean, I, I was at this debate the other day with this American guy and he was just saying how detentions were deeply cruel. And, um, I was saying 20 minutes, you do a bit of work, you go home. What's the big deal? <laughs> but he was saying that this was deeply cruel and that what you need, they call it restorative justice. So restorative justice is where they say the teacher comes and the teacher apologizes to the child and the child apologizes to the teacher <laughs> because the teacher is just as wrong as the John, child. your face is hilarious. You're hating this. Oh, but that was, <laughs> that, I, was, I just pictured it in my mind. It was the disgusting <laughs> image of someone groveling to a child and saying, I'm so sorry, Johnny. Yeah, 
that's what happens. And uh, but it's also the child. So the point is, is that you are meeting in the middle and you've restored the, the relationship. And isn't it wonderful? Now, the thing is, is that I do believe in restoring a relationship uh, at detention. The teachers come down and they have a, what we call a repair conversation. Uh, they say, now, you got into detention. Why did you get into detention? And the kid says, oh, because I turned around in class. And then the teacher says, okay, well, we don't want to do that next time, do we? And the boy says, oh, no, I don't want to do that next time. Okay, then. Great. Looking forward to seeing you in the next lesson. So the repair conversation is good, but notice how that conversation went. The teacher isn't apologizing. The teacher isn't meeting them in the middle. The teacher is being the authority figure and is saying, I want better from you next time. And the child is able to then promise that and follow that through. So you do want to have a chat, but you need to have the punishment because children understand praise and punishment. If I do the right thing, I get praise. If I do the wrong thing, I get punished. That doesn't mean you're beating them. You give them a 20 minute detention with a little bit of work that they do. They've actually, I mean, sometimes I worry that some of them want a quiet space to go and do some work and they want to get into detention so they can go and do their work <laughs> because it's not horrible. It's fine. Don't you think that behind this as well is because the, this this sounds like a, 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 you know, the broken window theory. It sounds like that idea of, the, you know, where you, you, you need to fix the, the broken window so that the graffiti, yeah. graffiti doesn't go in the car. You know, we all know how it goes. Anyway, I feel like well, that's why the... Sorry. Oh well, they might not know. Well, you need to listen. Explain, to- there's, a broken, there's a house. It, there, there's a house in some abandoned uh, part of uh, of, uh, of the town. Um, if all the windows are left intact, they will remain intact. You only need to break one window, and within a few days, all of the windows will be broken. That's exactly it. That's what Giuliani did to turn around New York. He started with the subway cars and removed the graffiti, and suddenly the crime went down, right? Like, that's what happens. You look after the little things, and the big things just don't happen. That's right. Yes, uh, Catherine explained it better than I didn't. And <laughs> it's... <laughs> no, no, no. You're a teacher. And I, did, I feel like I need the quiet room a bit. Uh, but, but so uh, but people obviously on the left, they, they don't like this idea. They hate this idea. They hate it because, because what they say is, oh, let's not... You know, um, isn't the car just being, isn't the window, aren't they just smashing the window because of, you know, the man or because of, you know, racism. systems or yeah, racism or whatever, take your pick or Poverty something. And racism. Yeah. Poverty, Poverty, yeah. And then you go and then they, they leave it at that. They say, and then you just take that idea and follow it to that guy you had a debate with. And he says, well, detention is just all poverty in that. And you go, okay, That's right. end of conversation. That's exactly right. That's it. And they just don't see culture. They don't see uh, environment. They don't see family. They don't see anything other than uh, poverty and race. And what that then means is that they then have lower standards for the poor kids and for the black kids. And that is outrageous because, again, I come back to the point that they're just racist in the end because they're not expecting the same from the black kids as they are from the white kids. They're not expecting the same from the poor kids as from the richer kids. And, of course, the poor kids or the black kids in the inner city, those are the ones who you need to have the highest expectations for. Because they're going to have all kinds of obstacles in front of them. Of course, it's easier to make it in life if your father is, you know, some top lawyer. Um, it's easier to make it in life than if your 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 father is, you know, working in the canteen at school. Of course, it is. Um, but how are you going to make it then? How are you going to get? How are you going to have a good life? You're going to have a good life by your school giving you all the knowledge and skills you need to be able to make something of your life. But if your school says poor you, your dad works in the canteen, so you can't possibly read Shakespeare, or you can't possibly do your homework, um, so I'm not going to expect it of you, then you are, you are, what you're doing is you're making sure that that child will never be socially mobile. You're making sure that that child will stay imprisoned in his birth place and never get out. And you're ensuring that the kid of the top lawyer succeeds. And they don't see that. Um, They just, because they're just so obsessed with this idea about poverty it, make, it makes it impossible for you to succeed. The thing is, I have known lots of poor kids that have succeeded. I've also known lots of poor kids who haven't succeeded. And the thing you need to then ask is, what is the difference between the poor ones who succeed and the poor ones who don't succeed? Well, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit about uh, where your teachers come from. Uh, do you find teachers that align with your ethos before you hire them, or do you teach your teachers how to teach the Michaela way? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in a way, we're self-selecting because they just, they, we're quite well known, so they wouldn't come here if they weren't somewhat open to what we're saying. But I do very much have to teach them because they, they come and they're a little bit, 
reticent, like, oh, is this okay? These are all interesting ideas. I do a session once a week with them all uh, for an hour where we talk about ideas, philosophy and politics and so on. We don't even necessarily talk about teaching. Uh, We'll talk about race. We'll talk about um, poverty. We'll talk about social mobility. We'll talk about the welfare state. And um, we discuss these ideas, uh, not from a leftist point of view. (laughs) Um, And so I let them know the kinds of things I think. I always make it clear you can think whatever you want. But um, hearing things from a different point of view makes them question their own views. And, um, you know, they, they struggle a bit because what happens is over time here, so over months and years, they begin to change their minds quite substantially. And then they find it difficult to get on with some of their friends who are all lefties like they were. <laughs> they, they find it difficult to defend uh, the fact that they work at this school and that they think it's a good school. And they themselves change their values. Um, and it can be hard, you know, for them. Uh, I, you know, if staff who, for instance, join here with a boyfriend or girlfriend, and then a couple of years later, they're splitting up with their boyfriend or girlfriend because they have changed so much yeah, <laughs> that they then find it difficult to connect with their boyfriend and girlfriend. The boyfriend and girlfriend's like, come on, let's go. Let's go spray paint the Churchill statue. And they're like, no, I, I don't want to do that tonight. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, what, what yeah, do you mean? Yeah. You've changed, man. You've changed. Yeah, that, yeah that, that, that's it. That's it. Um, I mean, it, it, it is, it is a, it's a problem for me in the sense that I don't want to destroy people's relationships. I don't want to, you know, I don't want them to lose their friends. But, um, it, well, it they'll, they'll find better relationships. Yeah. <laughs> Truer friends, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and the thing is, is that life is about learning, isn't it? I used to be a real lefty myself. I changed my mind and I changed my mind because of what I used to see in the classrooms where I was teaching in the various schools in the inner city. And over years I changed my mind and I too lost friends as a result. <laughs> so are there, are there teachers you know, sort of lining up to join now that now that you've got a bit more publicity, uh, you know, uh, and that and success, uh, tangible success, or, or are there still a lot of you know people who are too frightened? Well, I'd say there's a lot of people who are just too uh, ideological, like they don't agree with the schools. So you know, especially in teaching, m- most teachers are on the left. So there are a lot of teachers who, while they might be quietly listening and thinking, "Oh, I could change my mind," the idea of actually working here is to go too far. It kind of depends on the subject. Uh, So art, very hard. Music, very hard to to appoint for because they are artists. And of course, they don't believe in any... Like like finding a conservative art teacher is pretty hard. (laughs) So they don't don't want to come here. Musicians, same thing. But history, for instance, yeah, we will get uh, a lot of historians because they believe in teaching kids facts and them knowing stuff and they believe in British history and stuff. So it sort of depends on the subject. I'm just looking over at my board, my teachers. Uh, I mean, there are sort of shorted subjects like maths and science are always uh, shorted subjects anyway for anyone. Um, But I always say you only need one person to walk through the door uh, as long as they're the right person. So I don't need 50 people applying for a post. If I get two and I choose one of them and that's the right person, well, great, you know, but I wouldn't say that we are inundated by, with applicants. No. But that's because I'd say uh, teaching is a very leftist profession and it's very lefty. And I think people want to be considered to be good people. And if you're considered to be a bad person by your friends by coming to teach her, you just won't come and teach her. Well, that's that's sad to hear that that uh, <laughs> that, 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 that that would happen to someone. But, yeah, but we so, have teachers. So it's not like we don't have staff. We've got great yes, staff. I've got nice of staff. So you were recently appointed uh, the chair of the Social Mobility Commission. Can you tell us what, what's involved in that? So, I mean, it's only a few days a month. I'm still very much full-time at the school. But there's a secretariat that works on creating reports on the state, uh, the state of, of social mobility in the nation, essentially. And they can, we can give government advice, but we can also try and use the platform to give everyone advice on how to make themselves and their families more socially mobile. And so that's currently what we're working on um, and taking a fresh approach is what we call it to social mobility. I think often uh, people who are involved in social mobility think of themselves as a bit of a pressure group and to go and bang on government's door and say, spend the money on this strategy, spend the money on that strategy. Things are really awful. You need to fix things. And I'm not saying that there isn't room for that, that government can spend money on certain strategies. 
But then again, it is to, when you just do that, you don't recognize how much of the equation has nothing to do with government, <laughs> has to do with family, has to do with culture, has to do with values, has to do with school. And I mean, I know school is government provided, but there are some really great schools and there are some not so great schools. How do we make more schools great? But is social mobility even a word that that the largely left dominated area of education even uses? Or I mean, I was shocked when I read the, the words, really. It's not a word that I, because I mean, all the things you've just said are, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 not, not words that I hear on, on the left much at all. Well, I mean, what they want, when they think about social mobility, they think, that, well, as all of us do, there's a guy who's born into a certain section of society, uh, parents, father's a bus driver, mum's a dinner lady at school. And can he then become a lawyer or a doctor? Uh, can he enter one of those uh, professional managerial positions where, where he doesn't know anybody in his family who does that kind of thing? Now, that's how people tend to think about social mobility. They want the long jump from the bottom, and it makes for a very romantic story that you tell on a Hollywood film. He was born in the slums of Africa, and then he became a billionaire. You know, that's the kind of thing that they say. We are much more interested in the many and not the few, uh, much more interested in people being able to move shorter distances, but to do a job that they really want to do. It, it comes back to the girl's point. If people are choosing something, if they don't want to leave Manchester and move to London to become some top lawyer, and that actually they want to be able to uh, become a policeman, that's a good job, right? You don't have to become a billionaire or prime minister in order to be successful. I'm not a billionaire. I'm not prime minister. I'm really happy. Um, and the point is, is that you want people to lead successful and purposeful lives. And that doesn't necessarily mean enabling everyone to become prime minister or a billionaire. Well, it seems at, at the heart of your approach, is it fair to say that, that you're making some claims that frighten some progressive people? You're saying in part that not all ideas are equal that there are some people that are better off than others and, and that there is such a thing uh, as truth and beauty and goodness uh, and that your life will be better and more prosperous with these things uh, with these things rather than without them. Is yeah. that a fair assessment of, of your approach? Yeah. They care about equality. I care about equality of opportunities. They think that unless we have equal number of poor people being lawyers as equal number of rich people being lawyers, then this is an outrage and we need to fix that. Um, unless we have equal number of girls being, you know, physicists and boys being physicists, then this is an outrage. I don't think that's the case. I think that uh, people do have agency and they have choice and not everybody wants to do that stuff. Uh, now, I do think that it's wrong if they don't have the opportunity to be able to make the choices that they want to make and fulfill their potential. That's wrong. And one of the big things that enables uh, people to, um, to, uh, have agency and have choice is their school. We come back to the point that your school gives you the knowledge and skills that will enable you to make the kinds of decisions that you want to make to do something with your life. But if school is preventing you from make, giving, is not giving you those skills and knowledge, then you are not going to be able to make it in life. But they don't see it that way. They don't see it down here at the equal opportunity level. They say it's okay if the schools are bad. It's okay if you haven't been given the opportunity because we'll redress it in the end and we'll just have quotas and then we'll put the right number of black people, right number of white people, right number of girls and boys, right number of poor and, and rich, and then it'll all be fine. But I sort of think it's a problem if you have a doctor doing surgery on you who failed out of school. Like the, I, I worry about that, right? So I, I don't think you can fix it on the other end with quotas. You need to fix it at the beginning by making the, the schools good, by making sure families have the right kind of support to be able to educate their children properly so that they can then have all doors open to them in the future. Well, I want to ask you this question. I look at your school, Catherine, and I hear everything you're saying. I've heard a lot of what you had to say, actually. And uh, I think that your, your teaching philosophy is uh, a candle in the dark. And, yes. Um, <laughs> You have been so, you've been sought out by people like us all around the globe uh, because you stand alone to a certain degree, uh, or at least it seems that way. Uh, and I need you to tell me that there will be more candles lit. Oh, yes. Well, I can tell you that. I can tell you that, that we get 600 visitors a year, and they're not being forced to come here. 
and they come from all over the world and they are teachers and head teachers who write me letters and say, thank you for, um, for changing our, our, our school. Thank you for the ideas that we've taken and we're implementing in our classrooms because things are so much better. So we are influencing. Uh, the documentary was about having a bigger influence because what I realized was that 600 visitors a year, that's not very many people who are being influenced. The thing about the documentary is that it can millions of people across the world can access that documentary. People who can't visit us because they're abroad can now see what we do. And those rules are things that can influence families to be better families, and they can influence teachers to be better teachers. So I don't think all is lost. Um, I think that we are having influence and that we must all just keep fighting the good fight to, to try and, for my kids, you know, people say, why am I like this? Because I have seen so many thousands of kids failed by, by, by school. I've just seen so many failed and it's so sad. And I see how happy our kids are and how great and successful they are. And I just want that for all kids, not just here in this country, but all over the world. Well, I'm into that. Yes. <laughs> Well, Catherine, uh, how can people find you? Are, are you on social media? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, just on Twitter, because it already takes up far too much of my time. I couldn't go on anything else. Um, and my name on there is Miss Snuffy, Miss underscore Snuffy. The reason why I'm Miss Snuffy is because when I first started my blog way ages ago, before it turned into the book to Miss With Love, uh, I called myself uh, Miss Snuffleupagus. Mr. Snuffleupagus was the big uh, elephant kind of mammoth uh, on Sesame Street. We get remember- Sesame Street over here, Kath. We don't have <laughs> we to explain do. <laughs> Okay. Well, we're, not, we're not living, you know, I know you think that it's a bit bad <laughs> here in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, they, he, he, nobody could see him, if you remember. Big Bird was the only one who could see him. So he was the elephant in the room. So I called myself Miss Snuffleupagus because I was the elephant in the room because these were the uh, things I was talking about were the things that nobody else would talk about. And then when I set up my Twitter account, I just kept the same name. So I'm Miss Snuffy. Excellent. Well, everyone should follow you there. Uh, we, we have a final question that we that we ask all of our guests and, and we'd like to know what you're reading right now. The War on the West by Douglas Murray. Ah, uh, so am I. I'm reading that right now. Right. Yeah. It's Wonderful so good, stuff. isn't it? It's, it's so good. <laughs> it's delicious. I feel like I want to. I want everyone to read that book and to just yeah. to really to get angry, you know, and yeah. do something. Mm. Yeah, it's so good. He's so clever. He's just so good at. I don't know how he's like. He talks about the whole of the Western world, and he has all these stories, and mm. and it's so simple. You can you can. Um, I would recommend. So I was reading it, and then a friend borrowed my book. So then I got it on Audible, and I would say don't read it. I would say listen to it on Audible if you can, because he reads it himself. And oh, he's, right. you hear his kind of, his sarcasm and his disdain at times. And it's just so good. Honestly, it's so good. <laughs> it is absolutely <laughs> delicious. Well, uh, Catherine, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. You are tireless, uh, not just with your interviews and the way you put yourself out there, but we are in awe of the work you're doing. And, and no, honestly, it, it really is very, actually very moving. <laughs> so oh. thank you. I just want to thank you very much for everything Well, thank you, you know, because if I didn't have my supporters, it would be impossible. I would just get beaten down. And it's, I'm always so grateful to my supporters. So thank you and thank you to your listeners.